before we introduce uh, our uh, distinguished speaker for today, I'd like to uh, just introduce a few of our WLI executive board members who are here today, uh, two of which will be helping uh, moderate our networking session that's going to be kind of the end of, of today's workshop. So I'd like to uh, introduce Sheree Talbert. Sheree, could you wave to us? There she is. Hi, Sheree. Uh, Sheree everyone. is the... Good morning, Sheree. Thank you. She's joining us from Denver. How's the weather there, Sheree? Beautiful. Absolutely. Sunshine, still warm, unusual for this time of year, but it's beautiful. Oh, so we can be jealous of that too. <laughs> but um, everyone, Sheree is the uh, principal CEO uh, at CT Solutions LLC. She's an active member and participant in the Denver area Spartan Women in Philanthropy um, and is one of our newest uh, executive board members and we couldn't be more thrilled to have her a part of the WLI um, and helping as I mentioned today um, in our networking sessions. Thank you, Sheree. Thank you so much. Uh, another of our um, members who will be helping and joining, I believe, here shortly, um, I'm not sure I see her just yet, but I want to make sure to introduce Alejandra Delgado. Uh, Alejandra is the director uh, at Ankara, a consulting company uh, with expertise in the valuation of intellectual property. Uh, many of you all have probably uh, seen Alejandra and Cherie, who presented in uh, one of our uh, keynote events uh, last spring. Uh, Alejandra is uh, a former College of Social Science member, former econ scholar, and just uh, all around awesome uh, individual. And so Alejandra will be again joining us uh, hopefully uh, in a few minutes and then participating in that uh, networking session. And I'm uh, here, oh, just so you know, but yeah, <laughs> nice. I'm, I'm here. Sorry. Nice to be here. I didn't see you. There she is. Hi. Thank you so much. All right. There we go. When the Zoom room gets so big, I lose, <laughs> I lose track. Thank you so much. Uh, also on our call today, two other of our executive board members that'll be participating and learning along with us. I just wanna make sure to introduce them uh, to, to all of you in the cohort and Tom Lanovich and just an awesome, positive motivator. If you need a pick me up, call Anne. <laughs> She'll make you feel really good about yourself. So thank you, Anne, for joining us and just participating along with us. And then Celia Ebert, Celia, did you give us a wave? Another one of my go-tos for good advice, wisdom, and an overall pick-me-up. Thank you both so much uh, for joining us today. Now I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our speaker for today, uh, Felicia Watson. And we are just, let me just say before I read you know, a little bit to you about her, her formal uh, bio, we're blessed uh, to have her and to have her kick off uh, our cohort experience. Felicia is a well-rounded uh, public affairs professional with experience in public, nonprofit, and the private sector. During her over 25 years of professional experience, she's held positions as Community Stakeholder Relations Director, the State Senate Chief of Staff, Public Policy Director, and State Government Affairs Director. She's currently the Director of Until We All Win Portfolio at Nike Inc. and their Social Community Impact Group. Her expertise places her in a unique position to be effective. Uh, Felicia has created it developed and maintained strong relationships with stakeholders and connects issues with solutions. Her personal passions are uniquely expressed in her professional pursuits and her goal to inspire, impact, and create positive change in communities and in the world. Felicia received her Bachelor's of Arts degree from the College of Social Science woo -woo, at Michigan State University and a Master's of Public uh, Administration degree from Western Michigan University. Felicia lives by the motto, service is the rent we pay for our privilege of living on this earth. She is committed to serving her community and is honored to do so as, get a list, this is quite a list. So Felicia, you're, you're a busy woman. Uh, she is a member of the board of directors for the Horatio Williams Foundation in Detroit, Michigan. She's on the Michigan State University Black Alumni Association in their Atlanta chapter, soon to be their Portland chapter as well. Uh, she's part of the Michigan State University College of Social Science Alumni Leadership Council, a member of the Buckhead Cascade City chapter of the Lynx, a member of the East Point College, the Park Alumni chapter of the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, 
a part of the president's circle of the Detroit branch of the NWACP and a co-chair of the Michigan State University Black Alumni Association University Relations Committee. Wow, right? <laughs> Amongst all the other things she's doing. Felicia was named in 2017 the Clifton R. Wharton Distinguished Alumni for Michigan State University's Black Alumni Association. She is the Michigan Chronicle Newspaper's 2015 Woman of Excellence Award E and was listed in the 2015 edition of Who's Who in Black Detroit. Felicia was also named one of the best, brightest, and most beautiful by the New Citizens Press newspaper <laughs> in Lansing, Michigan in 2007. She's a native of uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, currently resides in Atlanta, Georgia for a few more months. Uh, she's a daughter, sister, mother, and aunt. And her proudest accomplishments among everything that I listed are her three sons, Joshua, Isaiah, and Evan. Felicia, thank you so much for joining us. Let's all give a Zoom welcome to Felicia. Mm, thank you so much. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much. Whenever someone reads your bio, you have to kind of just take a breath, you know, because you document it at, you know, as you're going along, you're building, when you come out of your career, and then you, when you see it all on paper or here, you're like, well, they're talking about me. <laughs> but thank you. In my mind, I'm quite a, lot. a little girl trying to find her way, but thank you. Thank you so much, Felicia. I want to begin, uh, if we could, Felicia, by uh, asking you a few questions. And, and first among them is, would you tell us a little bit more about your current leadership position, what's taking you uh, to Portland and your work with Until We All Win uh, at Nike? Yes, absolutely. Um, I've been at Nike now. It'll be a year in January. I took a leap of faith uh, last year after being at the Coca-Cola company for seven years and accepted a position on Nike's social and community impact team group on the inclusive community portfolio team. And I lead a portfolio of work called Until We All Win, which every time I say that it makes my heart flutter because Nike is not just a shoe company, it's a sports company. And we believe that if you have a body, you're an athlete. And that our job is to expose and level the playing field through sport. And until we all win clearly says that there's some work to be done because we're not all winning. We are not all starting out from the same start vantage point. Some of us have additional hurdles that others don't. So I joined the team and I lead the until we all win portfolio, which is a direct reflection of Nike's eight employee networks, Asian American, African American, Hispanic, Latino, um, LGBTQIA, military veterans, women, and I'm, all of a sudden I'm blanking, women, um, Native American, and ability or disability. So all of we, I have a small portfolio of money, which is about this year is um, just close to 6 million. And I work with uh, nonprofit organizations around the nation in those spaces to identify programs that we can support that help level the playing field for persons in those communities. So for example, I work with uh, an organization in Texas called Beyond the Ball that encourages young black children in Houston to not only focus on the athletic side of basketball, but the business side to show that there are opportunities in sport. Uh, I work with organizations that focus on social justice, the three pillars in Until We All Win are social justice, education, innovation, and economic empowerment. So I work with nonprofits all across the country with those three pillars in those eight communities to try to level the playing field. Uh, I learn something new every single day and I'm pleased to be a part of uh, the Nike family. If you're not familiar, Nike is, is an athletic company based uh, world headquartered in Portland, Oregon. We have 700,000, 70,000 employees um, around the world, all over the world. And um, our, our brands are Nike, Converse, and Jordan. So I just wanted to share a little bit about the brand. So I get to work with those three groups daily. And can you, and you can imagine I have a great time. Thank you so much for that, Felicia. That's great to hear about um, and really expanded, expand, excuse me, my view of Nike when I, uh, 
I have to confess initially just think shoes, but the work that you're doing is so uh, much bigger and broader than that. I appreciate that. Absolutely. If I, if I could add to that, one of the things that impressed me so with Nike is that we have a purpose. Uh, people, planet, and play. And everything that we do is tied to our purpose. Um, our purpose group is expanding. We have purpose brand folks. We have purpose marketing folks to make sure that everything we do is tied to our purpose. We want to save the planet. We want to make sure pe people are taken care of and we want to make sure people play. And so, in a, you know, we sell wonderful, phenomenal products that I'm, I'm sure that many of you have taken a part of. But all of that is tied to our purpose. And so I'll, put, I'll drop the link to our purpose in the chat so you can take a look. Thank you so much. Uh, another question I have for you, Felicia, over the 25 years uh, of leadership experience uh, and professional experience that you have uh, under your belt, could you tell us a little bit about your journey of becoming? You know, from mm -hmm. a bachelor's degree from Michigan State University to uh, all of the wonderful things that we just heard about in your bio and that you've been telling us that you're doing at Nike, you know, how, how did that unfold? And if you could, distill down maybe one major lesson that you learned along along the journey that you've been on sure um i'll start with the lesson the one major lesson that i've learned along my way along the way is don't ever forsake where you are right now trying to get to the next because where you are right now is a necessary step for you to get to the there to the journey um, life is not a destination, it's a journey. And I talked to many of the students in this uh, social science program and they're, they're really um, nervous that their job right out of college is not you know, the one that's making a ton of money or it's not directly tied to their major. And we put a lot of pressure on themselves, but I learned along the way that every job I had was a training ground or a lesson that I needed to learn to get me to the next point. My first job out of college, I was a secretary to a state senator who was a Michigan State grad. The chief of staff was a Michigan State grad and they needed a secretary and they said, hey, can you type? And hello, here I am. I just got my bachelor's degree. I, that's beneath me. You know, Why would I wanna be a secretary? I have a degree and a multidisciplinary degree from Michigan State. I'm supposed to be doing something phenomenal. That job was phenomenal. It paved the way for where I am now. I learned about the legislative process. I learned how to make relationships. I learned how to talk to people. And actually one time I tried to quit and the Senator says to me, you can't. I'm like, why can't I quit? And he says, because you have a future and I'm not gonna let you go because you have a future in this business. And I'm so grateful he did that. So. I say all that to say, never forsake where you are to thinking about the future. Right now, where you are right now is exactly where you're supposed to be. That's my greatest lesson. So I started out in the state center as a secretary. I got promoted to a legislative assistant. I got promoted to a floor assistant. And then I was the chief of staff. I left there and became a lobbyist for AARP in um, Lansing, Michigan for a while. I left there and was a lobbyist for a health system, but it was all because, and I'll say this too, every job that I had, have had and have, I became aware of it because someone I knew, it was through a relationship. And I could always go into the, to the, the site and add my resume and up, upload my cover letter, but it's the relationship that sealed the deal. So I would say that my path um, came this far because um, I didn't forsake the here and now where I was. I remember that life is a journey and not a destination. I kept up with my relationships and I was prepared because opportunity can always come to knock, but you have to be prepared to answer the door. So I think that that's probably my best description of how I got to where I am. And my hope that I'm not through yet. I'm I'm uh, in a different season in my life. I'm 51 years old. My children are grown. Uh, I'm taking a leap of faith and moving to the West Coast and, and you know, we'll see what's in store, but I'm always open to new opportunities. 
Oh, thank you so much uh, for that, Felicia. Uh, it was really inspiring. I saw so many heads nodding <laughs> as you were uh, telling us about your journey. And those things that stuck out to you. Uh, Felicia, uh, in the fall, we had uh, a keynote presentation that everyone in the room, uh, Zoom room attended. Uh, and the focus of that was looking at the future of work and leadership. Um, and in that session, we asked other our distinguished panelists uh, this question, and we'd like to get your take on uh, this, and specifically this idea of developing a vision for yourself. Mm -hmm. A familiar Chinese proverb states that the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. In the context of work and leadership, uh, this step may be akin to the emergence of vision. And so the question we have for you is, how does your vision today differ from the vision of your first step? Uh, and what are some practical exercises and advice that you may give to us about how to find a vision for ourselves and then to go and, and execute that? Interesting. That's a very good question. And I, I as, as a, you know, as an older woman, I'm, I'm, it's very different than from what it was when I was younger, graduating from Michigan State. Um, I, I realized too, I think maybe because Becoming a mother changed that, or I think too, my involvement with the college meeting with women like you. When I was younger, I thought it was about me. You know, what what accolades can I gain? How you know what money will I make, or um, what personal satisfaction will I get out of it? I learned later it's not about me. It's not about me. If I do what I love to serve other people to serve as an example, as other people have been as an example for me, if other people have been a mentor, a friend, a sponsor for me, that's the, the fulfillment that I receive. And so now I think that's my vision. My, my vision now is to make sure that as I progress, I bring someone with me. Uh, we talk about the future and I will tell you, we're, we're on our call now, the future is female. I mean, that's like a, a, a saying or a slogan right now, but that's true. Companies are sitting down every day recognizing that women have not been able to uh, succeed or have as many advantages as our, as our male counterparts. And we're gonna make that right. Uh, I just put the purpose.nike.com uh, link in there. And if you see our 2025 plan, our goal is to have at least 50% female at a certain level by a certain year. We have specific goals when it comes to raising the, the, um, raising the profile of qualified women. And so I don't take my role as a woman who has had a measure of success lightly at all. It is my job and my pleasure to um, include others as I go along. So my vision has changed. My vision recognizes now that it's not about me, it's about who I can bring along with me and who I can help along the way. I've been in rooms sometimes, you all, when I worked in the legislature, I remember being in the room during an appropriations hearing or an appropriations meeting where legislators were hammering out the state budget, which, is, which talks about funding for Michigan State, all of the universities. It talks about funding for healthcare. It talks about funding for um, K through 12 education. And I would look around the room and go, I can't believe I'm in this room, a room where such a heavy decision is being made. That made me sit up straighter and pay attention and make sure I use my voice so that people who didn't even know this meeting was exist was going on, their voice was heard. When I'm at Nike, I think about the nonprofit organizations that will either fold or survive on whether or not I approve a grant for $50,000. $50,000 may seem small to a Nike, which it is, but to a nonprofit organization who is providing sports bras to girls who don't have them, who wanna play sports, that's life or death to them. So my vision is to make sure I always keep others at the center of what I do, whether it's in my personal or professional life. And I admonish all of you, you're, you're bright, intelligent, um, women, make sure you take someone with you as you're going along. I, I love, you know, you first seeing that Felicia and we know, you know, all, all of you in the room th that she, Felicia lives this. We've had one of her, one, uh, there's many more, but one of her uh, mentees, uh, Tanisha with us. Uh, and it's just great to see the relationship and the mentorship that you um, 
have given to one another now uh, as, as you yes. roll. So it's, it's really something I know you live it, uh, these things that you're saying. And so thank you for that. I'd like to, you know, first to go back, um, we, you know, in your bio, one of the things that you say is a model that you live by. I really love it. I want to just say it again so we can all, all hear this. Service is the rent we pay for the privilege of living on this earth. Felicia, could you explain what this model means to you and how this is part of your why? Absolutely. I heard that model when I was a young girl. And if you Google it, it's attributed to a couple of different people. <laughs> Um, I was I was always taught that it was attributed to Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm, it was a it's a was a Jamaican immigrant, and she was the first woman to run for president, first black woman to run for president. She was unsuccessful. She is also the only black woman to have her portrait in the United States Capitol. If you have an opportunity, Google Shirley Chisholm. She had a wonderful life. But what that means to me is. You, we are privileged to be here. Um, all of our lives have meaning. All of our lives have purpose and there's a reason for our existence. And if we don't serve others, your, your being is kind of in vain. We are here to serve, I, tr I believe that, um, you know, to serve others. That's how we truly, <clears throat> Uh, value humanity. Um, that's the way that we can really help our world is if we serve others. And I really take that to heart. I tried to teach my children that. Um, the young women that I mentor, I always say, you know, they're like, thank you very much. You know, if there's ever anything I can do for, me, for you. And I said, what you can always do for me is pay it forward. Service is imperative um, to our existence, in my opinion, that it really makes a difference in the kind of society that we can and should be if we serve others. And if you operate with a servant's heart, you know, it kind of, um, I tell people all the time, humility is my favorite human characteristic. I love humility. I look for humility in people I vote for for public office. I look for humility in people that I surround myself with or call friend. And I think a person that has a servant's heart is worthy of our human existence. I really, I think I, I'm sure I got it, get, got it from my mother. If you all were to meet my mom, she's the most generous, humble person I've ever met. And I, I grew up in that. And so I take that seriously into heart and hope that you will too. Thank you so much for that. Um, what I wanna do now is, is open it up uh, to, to all of you to ask, questions of Felicia. I could go on for hours and hours. I always love listening to anything Felicia has to offer, but let me open up the floor. Um, feel free, you can put your questions in the chat if you feel more comfortable, um, but if you feel comfortable, go ahead and unmute and, and ask away. So we have um, about 15 minutes for that. I see two. I'm going to start with Zainab. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Zainab, pronounce your name for me, please. Are you still there? Z-A-I-N-A-B. She asked the question, have I ever met a professional athlete in Nike by any chance? And I wanna answer that because this is a really interesting story. When I worked at the Coca-Cola company, I was at work, I probably had been there maybe a month. And I was in Miami for a meeting. And one of my colleagues calls me and he says, get in the car, you're coming with me. And I'm like, I'm tired. We've been in meetings all day. I just, you know, I, I can't do it. He's like, trust me, come with me. I hemmed and hawed and moaned and groaned, didn't want to go. So he drives me in Miami. We drive downtown underneath the bridge. And I'm like, what are, dude, what are we doing? We go we get, walk around and get back. It was a taping of LeBron James Sprite commercial. And I remember the commercial when it played. It was like a it was like a band and it was all this going on and up walks LeBron James. <laughs> and I went, see, if I had not agreed to go with him, I wouldn't have had a chance to beat LeBron James. He was gracious. He was humble, really nice man. As he walks away, another man walks up, looks just like him. I was like, how is that LeBron James? And he just, it's his double. 
same height, same tattoos, same everything. So I say I love to say, if somebody says, come on, let's go, sometimes you just need to go. <laughs> but LeBron James is the only athlete I've met so far because I've been virtual working with Nike for a year. So I have not been on campus yet, but I'm looking forward to, um, to going to the Nike campus. And yes, Nike does offer internships for college students. Um, you have to stay alert to them. They post um, in the fall. So they're closed now. They post in the fall for, the, for summer. But yes, they do have, they post internships. You can go into nikecareers.com and um, set up an alert so that when internships post, um, you can be made aware. Also, when I'm awake, made aware of the internships, I send them to the College of Social Science. Here I did that. So I sent them to, um, uh, name is escaping me, but I will I, I just know that when I become aware of them, the College of Social Science knows. I will, I'll share it with, with the team too. When considering first steps after college, how should we balance options for more secure jobs or career options versus following our interests? There is, of course, something to learn from any opportunity, but how would you advise us to consider career risk? That's a great question, Anne. Great question. That's a million dollar question. Um, my major is social science. I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in social science. I was in the, it used to be called multidisciplinary program. Now it's called IDP, right? You familiar with that? Interdisciplinary, which means my majors were psychology, sociology, and political science. Can you get any more general than that? Really, really general. I say it to say the College of Social Science majors are a little more open. They're not as prescriptive as say a College of Engineering. Um, I have a 24 year old son who's in my house who has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. And we have this conversation daily. He has to be able to provide for himself, but he wants to do what he loves. I think there is a, 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 a crossover or a juxtaposition between what we have to do and what we want to do. Um, I think with um, research and reaching out to those who can help you, you can find the right balance. Um, between you do have to provide for yourself and, and you may have to take some jobs in the beginning to get you started when you can do more of what you love down the road. But um, all of them will make you a better, more viable candidate for the position that you really wanna have. It, it's, not a, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, try to strike the balance between the two um, without losing yourself in the process. You know, I never um, chased a title or chased a dollar sign. I mean, I had to be able to provide for myself. Um, when I graduated from college and I got the job as a secretary, my annual salary was $22,000. I had health, health and dental. And 22,000 for a college graduate now probably is peanuts. <laughs> but I remember getting my paycheck and I was thinking, wow. And I called my grandmother and I told her, and she's like, oh my God, what are you gonna do with all that money? So everything is relative, <laughs> you know, it's relative. So what's secure and what's, you know, what's, what's security and what's your passion may not be as far off as you think. So just try to strike the balance and consult with those. You have some wonderful women on this on this call in Amanda and Anne and Cherie and, and myself and those, uh, and um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get your name with the glasses on the iPad and Rachel. Oh, Celia. Yeah. Celia, Celia. Celia you've got great yeah. resources. Reach out to us. We can help you through that. We absolutely can help you through that. Uh, you mentioned how important humility is. What are some of the ways you recommend to practice humility? Mm. Um, taking the time to listen to people. Um, university is the best way to do that. 
when you are at university and you're in the dorm, have you learned or gotten to know individuals who don't come from backgrounds like yours? I remember I was in the line at Michigan State my freshman year. We used to register in the pit. Uh, Ann may know about this, Celia. The pit, we used to register at Jenison Fieldhouse. We'd walk down in the basement. We had a paper. We had paper. We had to walk from station to station to add and drop classes. The final step was payment. It was a big, it was like a, <laughs> a, a window where people were behind the window and you had to walk up and make your payment. I walked up and made my payment and I'll almost bring me to tears. And I had a check from my parents, a blank check. And my parents said, go to the counter. They'll tell you how much it is. Uh, you write a check. Those of us who lived in Yankee Hall would go to registration together. We'd walk over, to, over there together. And I just walked straight to the payment line. Several of my friends did not. They were in the financial aid line. They were in, I don't know how I'm going to make it line. They were in, I need a short-term loan line. They were in, I have to go home this semester line. And that quickly made me realize everyone's not in the position that I am. And I'm grateful for it. And I will always be grateful for the sacrifice that my parents made because they really didn't have it either um, for me to go. But that will humble you in a moment. Something like that will make you say, wow, that could be me. That could have been me. That can be me. So I think taking the time to get to know other people and their stories will humble you quickly. Um, and then in the service piece, if you're in organizations that serve, there are a lot of student organizations on campus that serve. If you serve in other places, if you go overseas and you serve and you see how um, the divide is between some, some places, that will, that will humble you quickly. So I think um, a great way to humble yourself is take don't always surround yourself with people who look like you, who come from the same places that you come from. If everyone around you is speaking the same terms or everyone thinks the same way, no one's thinking. Try to, try to go in different circles to gain insight about how other people live. That's my best um, thoughts about how to practice humility. When you face adversities, what do you do to be in balance again? Funny you should ask that question. I was asked that question. Um, I was just on the College of Social Science. I think it's a blog I was on and they asked um, a similar question. And I will tell you the honest to God truth is a phrase that my mother always says. And she says, it won't be this way always. And she always puts the emphasis on all. It won't be this way. When she spells it out, she says A-L-L -L ways. It won't be this way always. I know, remember when you were 13 years old and you could not get those jeans that you wore, whatever was in style when you were 13. I remember when I was 13, it was Jordan jeans. Oh my God, if I couldn't get a pair of Jordan jeans, I was going to die. The jeans cost $30 and my mom was like, I'm not paying $30 for a pair of jeans. And I thought the world was going to crash because I was not going to be in the eighth grade with Jordache jeans. Guess what? I'm 51 years old. I didn't get Jordache jeans. The world did not collapse and I'm still going. So the, the phrase, it won't be this way always. What you think is what you think is going to crush you, what you think is so hard, what you think is insurmountable, you will look back at it and laugh. I promise you. I promise you, well, what seems a, a, a mountain you cannot climb, you will look back and, and say, I did it. Uh, just on the other side of I can't is, I just did. So always know that it won't be this way always. And I think that ties into Megan, um, what has been the driving force to keep me motivated all these years. And it's, it's phrases like that. It's people like that. Um, I have been honored to be mentored and sponsored by some phenomenal people. Um, I, I grew up at Michigan State. I learned a, a lot about the world, people that I just absolutely adore that I'm still in contact with. 
And so those, those experiences definitely keep me motivated. And, and they help me when I hit those bumps in the road. Um, life, I say all the time, is really, really, really hard. There are going to be some moments in your life that are absolutely painful. And I tell young people that all the time. Um, there are some moments that I've had that have, I thought were going to crush me, that I was curled up in a ball in a corner and didn't know how I was going to lift my head. But the beautiful moments in between make all of those moments that I couldn't lift my head worthwhile. So when you hit a bump in the road, know that it won't be that way always, and that the beautiful moments are worth some of the pain that you have to experience to get to them. So I think about um, some of the challenges that I've had, but I think about this last year when I watched my son um, graduate twice because of COVID. He had to postpone one of his graduations. He graduated twice from Morehouse College here in Atlanta, Georgia, and then he got a master's degree from Auburn University in Alabama. That was worth it. Any pain I went through was worth that. So keep going, keep going. Don't stop, keep going. Uh, one more thing, if you don't mind, I'm going to put a link to a song in the um, chat too. I, I love music. I love music and quotes. And so when I get in my little um, moments, I, I think of the song. It's a song called Go Get It. And I'm going to put that in the chat in just a second. Julia, do you have a question? Julia, have we met before? I feel like we have. I'm not sure, but you okay. you feel very familiar, and yeah. um, I wanted to express your story and your your work is so inspiring. Thank you for like sharing with us, um, and I'm definitely inspired by your work with nonprofit groups um, to help meet your Nike's team goals. And I think that um, I was wondering what is what was in it impactful experience that you've had, like working in these communities with the voices that you're trying to represent, you know, being on the Nike team. Was yeah. there any, um, ex I'm sure that there's been many, many. Things, but maybe what's one impactful experience? If you don't mind, I'm going to share an impactful experience that I had at Coca-Cola. Do you mind? I was, um, one of the grants that I gave when I worked at the Coca-Cola company was to um, an organization called Phi Theta Kappa, and they provide scholarships for students in junior college. Uh, these are students who may not ever go to four-year university. They may stop there, or they may go on to a trade. And, a general, and so I awarded the grant annually to Phi Theta Kappa, and I would go to the dinner and stand on the stage and wave and, you know, shake all the students' hand. And afterwards, a gentleman came up to his wife. He was probably in his 40s. They had five children. He said, your scholarship changed the trajectory of my family's life. And that humbled me like no other. And it made me realize my voice is important in these rooms. A person came to me and said that a box I check or a, a, a grant I approved at work that just, you know, your daily work methods, when you look at work in phil corporate philanthropy, you approve grants all the time. That one pen swipe that I made changed that man's life. And so that made me realize that you can always have an impact. People can say, well, I can't, I, I don't, I don't have any um, I, I'm not in a position to have any impact. You're always in a position to have impact, it, it, no matter how small it may seem, and use it for good when you have the opportunity, if you would. So, you, so if folk, Danielle, you know that song, Go Get It, right? Sorry, I love it. I, I blast it in my car and sing at the top of my lungs. So, now you know. Pronounce your name for me, Akshana. Akshaya. 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 Yeah. Um, so yes, I do have a question for you. And first, again, thank you so much for taking the time and speaking with us. Um, wow. I've been saying wow ever since I came into the Zoom. Oh, like, it's so inspiring. And I loved when 
you were talking about your lesson, you know, don't ever forsake where you're going and next thing in your life, it kind of reminded me of what I live by and like how I live by everything happens for a reason. There it is. Um, I live by that and I totally, totally believe in it, you know, where you go in life, everything happens. And uh, yeah. it just felt so good speaking. It just inspired me. And just having this whole uh, topic of finding your why and yes. your vision, I had a question. Do you have any steps or advice to help us found, find our why and our vision or taking the steps to find our why and our vision? Sure. One of the things that I want to say to you uh, women is I want you to be, first of all, back up. I'm humbled to be here too. I'm honored to see your faces and you inspire me too. So know that it's not one way, it's two way. The other part is get real comfortable with yourself. I think we as women um, are not really comfortable with ourselves, with our bodies, with our imperfections, with our likes, with our dislikes, what, what we will tolerate and what we won't. Sometimes we as women are deemed as pushy or aggressive or the B word, if we know what we want and we know what we will tolerate and what we won't, get really comfortable with yourself. Get to know yourself really, really well. Spend time with yourself so that as you're developing your vision, if something approaches you that's not a part of your vision, you'll recognize it clearly. If it's a relationship, if it's a job, if it's friends, if it's any of those things, if you know yourself really, really well, you'll recognize what's not for you. And so if you know what's not for you, you'll know what is for you, and you will focus on that as your why. Um, I, 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 I feel like I've, I'm still developing it every single day, but my why is to help others. I'm clear on that but it took a whole, whole lot of bruises and bumps and some frogs I kissed and some knees I scraped to recognize that. But I've gotten really comfortable with me. Um, I have a girlfriend that says all the time, no is a complete sentence. No, but you can also say yes. On the other side of that, I'm saying no to you. Like, you know what? No, I'm not gonna, I don't, I don't, I don't want to uh, meet you out for dinner at midnight. I go to bed at 8.30 at night, no. Um, those are um, non-negotiables. I, I, I work up, I wake up every morning at 2.45. I leave my house at 3.30. I work out from 4 a.m. to 6.30 every day, Monday through Friday. It is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I go to bed at 8.30 at night every day. People are like, really, Felicia, 8.30? Yes. Really, Felicia, you go to work out at 4 in the morning? Yes. I found out that I don't, if I don't work out early in the morning, I don't do it. If I have to wait till the evening, I don't do it. I also know that my body for my health reasons and from places I've been, I must work out if I want to see my grandchildren. So those are non-negotiables for me. That's part of my vision. So get to know yourself really well and you'll be clear on what your vision is. Adina. You have a question? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that actually, what you just mentioned, the whole schedule really got the question I had. First of all, thank you again for joining us today. It's been amazing hearing everything you've been through and really inspiring. Um, the fact that you've been so successful, I'm sure it took an intense amount of work and a lot of discipline when it comes to you working out and things like that. Have you ever gotten to a point where you thought my work-life balance is not balanced? I spend too much in the office or I spend too much time, you know, working on this, that, the other that I feel like I'm missing out on my personal yeah. life. And how did you fix that? Yeah, I'll give that in a two-part answer. I, I think that the term work-life balance is a farce. And Anne knows what I'm talking about. It is not um, something's going to give. We're not, we're not superhuman. So don't beat yourself up about the balance. Do what you can while you can, when you can. Um, my sons are, bless their hearts, they're very in tune with themselves and they'll say, mom, let's watch a movie. And I'll say, okay, let's go watch a movie. I sit down, I'm on my phone, I'm on my computer and they'll say, mom, we're watching a movie. I need you to be present. You're absolutely right. So my sons give me grace when sometimes I'm not as balanced as I should be. So give yourself grace. Um, 
when you're not able to find a perfect balance. I just don't think it, I don't, in my experience, I've not been able to get there where it looks like this. Some days it's this, some days it's this, some days it's that. Um, uh, I was married once before. I hope to be married again. And in marriage, they always say marriage is 50, 50. Some days it's 80, 20. Some days it's 70, 30. Some days it's a hundred zero. <laughs> You know, and your spouse has to carry you when you can't carry yourself. So I think work-life balance is the same. Do what you can, while you can, when you can. And when you can't, give yourself grace to make up the difference. These are all my thoughts. They are not endorsed by Nike or Coca-Cola or, or my kids or anyone. These, of course, are just my thoughts and, and my life as I have experienced it. We should thank you so much. I think you should write a book. I mean, you your thoughts are, oh my gosh. I know, and I see many in the room, we're scribbling notes feverishly. Um, I, 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 just, I just love everything that you've been oh, so open and honest to share with us. Are there any other questions? We're going a little into our networking time, but this has been too good. Um, and I want you, the students, to really have your moment uh, to connect with Felicia. Is there anything else that you uh, have? Oh, oh, so see, you got one person going to buy your book or no two. <laughs> I thought about it. Uh, I don't like, wow, what would I say? Um, yeah, uh, maybe. I think, yeah, listen, we should all write a book. We should all, because um, I have a, um, a woman I follow, Iyanla Van Zandt, and she always says, what's your story as a woman? What's your woman's story? You know, your children, they know your mother's story. Your husband, he knows your wife's story. Your employer knows your employee story. What's your woman's story? Who are you as a woman? What, what makes you tick? What, what, what made you who you are? So I think all of us could write a book and, and people would be interested in your woman's story. So think about that too. <laughs>